and Chao. Please welcome. House, and I'm really honored that you made the time to be here in the middle of a global pandemic. Can you hear me okay? I feel like this mic is cutting out a little bit. I think that's better. Um, in the middle of the situation that we are in right now, um, the fact that you made the time to be here, um, that you're giving us your attention and your time is something that I don't take for granted. So thank you for being here. Um, my name is Christine Mungai. I'm the curator here at Baraza Media Lab. Um, Chow and I have been working on putting this together for the past five months. And I'm so happy that this day is finally here. Um, so I just want to make a quick announcement before we begin. Um, some of the material that we are interacting with today um, and that we've already seen um, can be quite emotional and painful um, when you contemplate the weight of history um, and how that legacy plays out in our own lives. Um, it can trigger some, some emotions, some sadness, some kind of fatigue or um, any other kind of negative emotion. At the back of Baraza Media Lab, just beyond uh, the booths there, at the back there, um, there's a lounge area, comfortable seats, nice ambience. So if you need a moment to just decompress or catch your breath, um, in the process of this interview or at the end of it, um, there's an area there where you can sit and just, you know, gather your thoughts. Uh, we are affirming that this is a, a space where such emotions are welcome and we've created room for them. Sawa sawa. Um, I'm not happy with how this mic is sounding. Cynthia. All right, um, I've introduced myself. I'm a writer and journalist, and like I said, curator of this space. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I'm so excited to be here with Chao Tayana, who I've, I first met on Twitter. Twitter is an amazing space sometimes, just sometimes. Um, and um, like I said, this has been months in the making, um, but the story is really years, decades in the making, right? And this is what our conversation today will touch on. Um, just trying to figure out what are some of the, the links or the fruit of um, this part of Kenya's history that we don't do very well before, yeah? Um, and every time I encounter information that um, kind of underscores this, I'm always, um, I'm always interested in speaking into the silences. What are the parts of our story that um, we've kind of buried underneath uh, the thing that we know to do so well, which is co-founder of the Museum of British Colonialism, which was founded in January of 2018 um, by a group of women in Kenya and the UK who recognized the need um, for a space to restore and to make visible the suppressed, destroyed, or underrepresented uh, parts and histories relating to British colonialism. I'd like you to tell us, um, how do you, in your own work, come to terms with this process um, and the result of this suppression and destruction of history? Um, as Kenyans, I think we don't really know, we don't know what we don't know, right? Um, and how do you process this gap which is not just a simple lack of data, but it's something bigger than that. It's almost an erased consciousness about such an important part of our history. Thank you, Christine, uh, and thank you to everyone who is here today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to have people attend an event that is an entirely volunteer-led group, um, which means that everyone just d dedicates whatever time and skills they have towards the initiative. And really the thing, I think the special thing about MBC is we are aware that we don't know. So I think 
maybe I would start by saying it's the awareness and the acceptance of this gap that brings us to this space. So in a way, sort of like um, embracing the gap in itself. And just to speak um, as to how this work uh, contributes, even when I think about those of us who are born into this post, I would say post-colonial systems, yeah, we know nothing else. This is our reality. This is our every day. It's our Monday, it's our Friday, it's our Sunday. It's, it's everything we know. And we are born into these structures and systems that are built on colonial paradigms and schools of thoughts, and it, it, it informs everything. It informs our education, it informs our healthcare, it informs our policing system. And I think as children, particularly, you just believe that the world is just like that. What you see is what you take yeah. in, you know? So white people are just superior. European countries are just better. better you know, yeah. there's this thing that I call the justness. It's just like that. And for me, the scary thing about encountering this history as an adult is, is what I call the injustice of the justness. You know, you, you're led to believe that this is just how things are. And you, you grow up in a system that doesn't teach you to question. It doesn't teach you to challenge. It doesn't teach you to ask questions. And what it does to you when you encounter this history, I think you feel incredibly guilty. There's a sense of, there's a heavy sense, there's a very strong sense of, of regret or shame or shame, just confusion exactly. yep. that you bring to the table. Yes. And for us, I think looking at... We're talking favor. about the British literally destroying archival exactly. material, right? So you have um, Operation Legacy, which is, which is a movement or sort of this, this campaign by the British government to destroy all colonial records or, or records that would embarrass the Queen or um, shine a bad light on Britain with, within the countries that they're exiting. And in Kenya, a lot of records are, de are destroyed, particularly records on detention. So what does this mean? It means for those of us who are reconstru reconstructing this history, we have nothing to use in terms of archives. It means we have to apply for visas to go to London. You know? So I mean, there's a lot of weight that is not just about the history itself, that is very present in your undertakings of this history today. Yeah. Right. Um, Chao, what has surprised you as you've been piecing together these histories? Ah, a lot. But I think in summary, it's the fact that so much is hidden in plain sight. You know, I think the history of colonialism is invisible, but somehow visible everywhere. You know, in your street names, in your, in your building, go back to this justness of it's just like that. Um, the fact that it's everywhere and nowhere at the same time, I think that for me has been the biggest surprise of all. Yeah, it's not just in a museum and this is the history of colonialism, but particularly embedded in everything that we do as a country. We're going to go back to that idea of being hidden in plain sight. Um, but right now, I'd like to ask you, um, at Baraza, we believe that there are some stories that only uh, you could tell. What we mean by that is that there are people and places and events in your life that only you can describe and give meaning to because of what life has given you. So I'd like to ask you, uh, I'd like to you to map out for us briefly, what do you think it is in your life that led you to do this work? Um, I'll give a quick segue into my own example. Um, I only read Britain's Gulag like a couple of years ago, and I'm someone who uh, imagines that I have a fairly strong grasp on history, but that book made me realize how much I didn't know. Um, a, f a few years ago, I kind of wrote half-jokingly about the impact of the emergency published it. <laughs> um, and it was, it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek piece, but it was also quite serious that um, I had grown up knowing that there's something wrong about Kikuyu cooking, right? It's just like that. Yeah, it's there's something like wrong about <laughs> it, but I, 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 this article was trying to like connect that kind of like to fill in that gap. What is it about this emergency period that shows up in our cooking, that mm. shows up in our food, right? So what is it about your life? Um, that Speak um, from a personal level. The first time I encountered particularly the detention camps was I think two years ago, actually in January 2018. And I happened to be in London with a friend of mine, Olivia, who's also a co-founder of the museum. And I was sitting in her living room just skimming through Britain's Gulag, as you're saying. 
and that says these camps, Embu, Kajado. And I remember the shock of looking at these spaces, at these towns and these names that I recognize, obviously, as towns in Kenya, but I had never ever thought or even knew that they were all detention centers. And it was interesting to, to me that we're not just talking about one camp or an obscure place in, in central Kenya, we're talking about tens of camps, probably, I think. And, and for me, that was a big, big shock um, in terms of allowing me to challenge the gaps that I had. And the second thing was approaching it from a very personal perspective. Um, once I started researching on the camps, I went and spoke to my grandfather. And he said, oh yeah, my mom was in a camp for seven years. This was something that he rarely talked about. We did not know at that point. And I thought to myself, how many of these conversations are not happening in homes and families? And that, that was a big motivation for, for the work that we're doing. But also to speak to your point on personal stories that you can best, you can, you, you can, you can only, only speak only for yourself. You can tell them, right. Exactly. Um, there's this book that I brought with me, actually, and it's called Mau Mau Detainee. And this is, I think, one of the only, if not, one of the few, if not the only, first-hand account of um, life in detention by J.M. Karaoke. I think I have a few excerpts I'd like to read just Please, to speak to ahead. the experience. So he starts by saying, I'm a Kikuyu who was detained in 14 of Kenya's detention camps between 1953 and 1960. The book is largely the story of my years in these camps. It is written not in any spirit of bitterness or spite, but because no one has yet told the truth about these camps and because they have become an important part of the history that is my country. Manyani, the largest camp capable of holding up to 30,000 of us, is now a word deeply entrenched in the language of every tribe in Kenya. And no one can hope to understand the present temper of Kenyan African politics without some awareness of the life led by 80,000 detainees during those periods of emergency. Possibly, too, some description of how we organized ourselves in, in difficult conditions will be of interest to those who may still be in danger of a similar fate in other parts of Africa. But to help the readers judge the value of what I have to say, I should perhaps begin by telling something of myself and my life in detention. So J.M. Karaoke is detained in 14 camps in seven years. You know, so when we're talking about detention, I think we have to realize that it wasn't just you spending time in one camp and going back home. You would be moved literally across the country, and it was actually a system where the more hardcore you are, then the more you would be taken to the camps on the periphery in the remote, remote places, and the more rehabilitated you became. So by rehabilitation, we mean denouncing the Mau Mau. Then you would get closer to home. So it was actually a system of, of, of different camps, and you would be passed through each hence. So by yeah. that you mean you would start, let's say, in Lamu or in Lodwa. Yeah. And as you renounce Mau Mau, you come closer to your home, let's say, in Nyeri or in Muranga or in Kiambu or anywhere else that you're from, right? Exactly. And what would happen um, when there were screening camps where you would, you would be categorized into either, I think, black, white, or gray. And obviously, black was the most hardcore. hardcore. Yeah. Um, and um, w the, the, the more you confessed or denounced the Mau Mau, then you were categorized as white. So if you're categorized as black, quote, unquote, then you would end up in the exile camps, mostly that were in you know, areas like Sayusi. So you're talking about this pipeline, this system that funneled people um, through the different categorizations. The hardcore are called the black detainees, then the gray, then the white. Um, the aim was to extract confessions of allegiance to Mau Mau. Um, and the network of camps and villages was intended to, as you've said, to cure people or to rehabilitate them from Mau Mau. Um, in Britain's Gulag, um, Caroline Elkins writes about the way Mau Mau was actually considered some kind of disease, some mental illness of some kind. So they were actually quite deliberate with this curing language, that it was supposedly native Africans who had been taken over by this like mass hysteria or communal mental illness, which made them um, you know, take the Mau Mau oath or to dream of freedom or things like that. Um, and they were supposed to perform hard labor as their way of um, re-education into British moral values. Like that was the language. Working was supposed to 
um, rehabilitate you into British moral values. Um, Chao, I'd like to ask you, how do you process not just to call Mau Mau a mental illness? Um, reminds me of something I read a few years ago that in, in the American South during slavery, there was supposedly an, a mental illness called, <coughs> let me try and pronounce it, drapatomania. And drapatomania was supposedly a mental illness that afflicted enslaved um, Africans or enslaved people of African descent. And the number one symptom of this mental illness was the irresistible desire to flee captivity. Like that's the one diagnosis, that's how you have the disease. Chao, how do you process this kind of violence that's not just on the body, but it's also on the mind, and it's also in the language? I mean, it's interesting that you asked that question because I think when I first came across this kind of language, for me, I was a bit irritated. You know, I was like, this is a serious thing, you guys. It's not, you know, this is not something that you can brush off, but you can see how the British government's, um, colonial government's refusal to acknowledge black pain and black suffering leads them to this point where we're talking about the Mau Mau because the Mau Mau was not exist, the, the uprising was not existing in a silo. You know, 30 years before the state of emergency, Harry Thuku was being arrested. And uh, I think he was uh, 2,000 people outside the police station in Nairobi protesting for his release. And the police opened fire. It said that um, the Europeans who were on their balconies and the verandas took out their guns and started shooting into the crowd. You know, now the official reports from the colonial government say 21 people died, um, but the African staff who are working at the morgue say 56 people died. And this was, in, I think, essentially the first form of political protest, and they were campaigning for the same things, land reform, freedom. So for me, for Mau Mau to be treated as this disease, you know, the words that we are so used to seeing, primitive, irrational, you know, um, it's basically, yeah, savage. It was basically seen as just an attack on white supremacy instead of a deliberate and a very intentional um, fight for what is yours. And I think to come, for, for me personally and also for the museum as we work, to come to terms with this history, we have to avoid and subvert the singularity of the way it's taught. You know, that Mau Mau was one thing, Harizuku was one thing, Kadu and whatever were the other thing. These were all the people working towards the same goal. And I think um, when you look at this resistance as a long chain of action spread over generations, you know that what we are doing today is a part of that resistance. I think for me it helps contextualize this work as, as part of something more, but part of something that had already begun before me, yeah. Right, um, Chao, do you see any of these um, fragments, fragments of this kind of thinking in kind of our political language today of medicalizing social and political problems into things like vijanas wasikuhizi, like you know the youth of nowadays, um, or making it an issue that is quite individual and personal, rather than we are a society that's living with, you know, the weight of a very painful history. I think definitely when we see the language that is used to address legitimate concerns and legitimate issues that people are facing, um, widespread disregard for citizen needs and, and for community needs. When you look at, for example, when, you were when you're talking about, I think, what was it, the, the ways in which Mama is spoken about, um, there's a section in this book where he talks about the time he was taken to a camp in Turkana. And he says that um, the camp that they were in it only had like a very loose barbed wire fence. And they, when they got there, they thought, but it's so easy to escape. But little did they know that the British uh, the administration, the district administration had put a price on their heads. So they told the Turkana and Samburu that if you catch any Kikuyu out there, bring us friends in Ghana, the Gold Coast. There were rumors, or basically the, as kids and as people who are hearing about it here in Kenya, they were told that, oh, you know, Ghanaians eat their children. That's why they're complaining. You know, and he says... That's a very <laughs> interesting thing, that um, these rumors of this community practices cannibalism mm, exactly. is something that actually comes up yeah. fairly often, again and again, yeah. right, as a way of discrediting exactly. something legitimate. So right? he says, for example, that the Turkana were told that Kikuyus eat their children from the uterus, you know, very gory things. 
and he says, I think I actually noted this line down, and he says that it, it seems that all Africans fighting for independence ate their children in the eyes of the Europeans. <laughs> you know, so even that recognition that, you know, this was the propaganda machine of the state was incredibly powerful, and it was functioning in ways that I think we probably wouldn't even understand at this point. Um, for example, the use of mobile cinemas, which would go around different parts of the country just portraying this really um, hateful films about the Mau Mau to different communities. So I think in terms of propaganda, in terms of looking at the intentionality of diminishing this struggle, we have to counter it in the work that we do very actively. Talking about diminishing things, we are still a country that asks students in school list the advantages and disadvantages of wearing sneakers on a Friday, you know. I, I think raise I your hands if you answered that question. If you answer the question, list the advantages and disadvantages. I, I had the answers. I, I got an A in history, guys. <laughs> if you get an A in history in the 844 system, wow. wow. Like, oh. I listed those advantages, <laughs> trust me. Um, okay, um, Chow, I want us to shift our attention now to the fact that after independence, um, many of those villages and works camps commissioned um, my friend, the writer Lutivni Majanja, who is somewhere here. Just wave. You don't have to wait. There she is in the corner there. Um, we commissioned Lutivni to write an article that would trace the links between past and present terrors, um, making it plain that um, the seemingly common sense association of education and, you know, high school is a prison. High school was a prison. High school is a prison. But in many cases, high schools that we went to were actually detention camps. Like, it's a literal link between, you know, education goals mm -hmm. and incarceration as a process, right? Um, Aguthi Works Camp which is the one which um, we did a 3D reconstruction of, the one that was on the table, the miniature model, um, exists today as a girl's secondary school. Um, it turns out that one of my relatives went to this school, uh, and I didn't even know that. So this linking, this kind of casual linking between education and imprisonment, um, in some ways is not even a metaphorical linking, it's a literal one, right? That Aguthi Works Camp was repurposed into Kangubiri Girls High School. Um, what's your reaction to this link of the afterlife of that pipeline? So I'd speak to the reaction of visiting the spaces first, yeah? And when we decided to do field work, we started with two schools, Kangubiri and Mweru, as you've seen in the videos, and I, I don't know what I was expecting, but to see buildings with barbed wire that are classrooms was an extremely, I, I don't know, it, it, I was emotional, let me just say that in summary. And I think to understand what it means to turn these buildings into schools, or even prisons, we have to understand how they were used, yeah? So, on 30th of August, 1955, I was sent by a train with 42 other detainees to Manyani camp. Manyani looked the same, hundreds of uniform aluminum hats gleaming on a plane, thousands of wardens rustling to and fro in their khaki uniforms, and 15,000 human beings seething inside an electric fence. Black skins dressed in white prison clothes looking for freedom. The small cell I was kept in was a corrugated iron sheet, iron structure with a cement floor about six feet by four feet. There were 32 such structures all, all in all at Manyani, and they gave me no food or water, but fortunately, someone had thrown a bucket of water onto the floor to make it uncomfortable for me to sleep on. So for the first three days, until this water dried up, I was able to lick the wetness of the cement, and during that time, I could think straight and speak out loud to myself. On the fourth and fifth days, cold water started coming out of my skin, in a sort of sweat. Still no food or no water came by. On the sixth and seventh days, my eyes became heavy, and that's when the nightmares began. So this is JM talking about his experience in one of these solitary confinement cells. So I use that paragraph to transport you not only into the physical structure, 
but into the intangible memories and into the intangible histories that these buildings hold. So once we recognize that this is what this space was used for, what does it mean that students still in this country, this independent country, still continue to use these buildings without an acknowledgement of what they were? So there's a betrayal, I think. Quite a number of schools uh, were camps and, 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 and prisons. Um, but for us to contextualize the nature in which they're used today through the experience of our personal experiences and the experience of our grandparents and parents who were there. Yeah. Right, um, that's JM's experience. And yet today, you would go to Dagoretti High School. Maybe you have an idea that this was a detention camp, or maybe you don't. Um, but there's a way that, for example, we run high school in particular um, as an institution that has very similar links to detention and incarceration, right? And there's a way that we are taught to be grateful for it, right? Um, so I'd like to just read an excerpt from Lutivini's article um, where she talks about her own experience in high school. I want you to be in conversation with what Chao has just read. So put in mind what Chao has just read about JM's experience in solitary, right? Um, and Lutivini writes this. If we didn't have a regular water supply, at least we didn't have to go to the river. And if we had to go to the river, we had adventures anyway. If we were denied visits, at least we were allowed letters. And if the teachers read our letters, then at least they, they let us have them after. When our meals were unpalatable, we'd innovate new recipes and create our own underground spice roots. If we had to work on the school farm, at least we'd find, we'd find ways to get away with roasting maize or slaughtering and cooking the school chicken. If we were beaten in our school, at least it was with sticks and not with belts or cables. If disciplinary action involved having to work on the school farm, then at least we'd blow off some steam. If our prefects humiliated us unnecessarily, then at least it wasn't so bad that we'd set them on fire. If we got caught escaping school, then at least they didn't ask us to return with barbed wire for the fence. And if, even if the school demanded that we report back with barbed wire, at least we, we were grateful that they'd never given up on us, letting us stay to do our exams. We toughened. We'd never gained such grit at home. We followed their assigned routines. Apologies. We, we followed the assigned routines and recognized ourselves as rehabilitated, even though we didn't know what our malady was to begin with. I'm sure this speaks to so many of our experiences in um, these institutions where we, we are not really aware of the logics, but we are taught to diminish everything. You know, I was telling someone the other day that what is normalized is so big and what triggers rage, alarm, or panic really has to be extreme. But kind of these low levels that you're made to feel grateful. And I think it goes back to the concept of rehabilitation. Like we have cured you of this Mau Mau disease. Go back into society and flourish. And, you know, and, and in, our, in I think the contemporary case, it's more like we've cured you of yeah. this disease called adole, this, exactly. adolescence. <laughs> Adolescence is something that yeah. needs curing, you know, in the Kenyan yeah. imagination. You yeah. can't question teachers. You have no voice. You know, essentially, you're there to be told what to do. And the parallels are insane. For a lack of a better word, they are insane. And I'm trying to think of any other space or any other country where this has happened, and it would be good to know. But it, is, it speaks, I think, to the nature of, you know, Kenyatta saying, let's forgive and forget. But what are we forgiving if we don't know what we're forgiving, you know? And the fact that, I Chow, think it's, it's I, I think because what you've said, we don't know what to forgive, yeah. then we are made to forget. Exactly. Yeah. And when you look at, you know, the, the dual nature of it, that the mama were fighting for their children. So it is because of us that they're fighting, but it's still because of us that they have to be forgotten. I mean, it's, yeah. It, it, it does cross my mind a lot of the times. I don't think, so as part of, um, you know, work that as a journalist that I've, you know, written over the years, 
not all countries in Africa fought for independence, mm -hmm. like had an armed movement, a resistance yeah. movement. They were really just a handful. Most of them were kind of granted administrative, uh, um, sorry, declared its liberation movement a banned group. Mm -hmm. Like it actually banned its liberation fighters. No other country in Africa has done that. Not Algeria, not, you know, Guinea-Bissau or any of these other countries. And for most of these other countries, at some point, this group that fought for independence acquired political power at some point, right? But in Kenya, um, the group that conducted this armed struggle was immediately proscribed as a Terrorists. banned group, right? And they would remain designated as a terrorist group for 40 years. And it's only in 2003 when this ban was lifted. I mean, just think about mm -hmm. that for a moment. No other country in Africa has done this. Yeah. And it's interesting because you see the Mau Mau inspire, you know, the Black Panther yeah. and have such global recognition. But we're, we're saying that until 2003, I think, 2003, that's when Mau Mau was delisted as a terrorist organization. So for 40 years, um, it was still a terrorist organization. But what does this do? It means that people can't form organizations. They couldn't take the case to the British. To, they couldn't sue the British government until it was delisted. And I think it contributes generally to the overall suppression. And when we ask, why don't we know this? It's not through a fault of our own. We're not just sitting there thinking, we're not going to talk about this. There are very deliberate systems that have been put in place to keep you in that box. And I think allowing ourselves to recognize that frees us from the burden of stepping back and saying, but we don't know how to handle this. It's not, it wasn't within our, in our, in our control. And the way I see it now, it is through media, through data. Coming to the end of our conversation, this part of our conversation, um, Chow, this work is heavy. It's emotionally brutal. Um, museum. So I've spent a lot of time, you know, looking through the exhibitions in, in the digital sense. Um, and every time I feel physically tired, there are days I have to go to bed early, you know, because you know, in preparation of this event. Chao, I'd like to ask you, what are your practices for cultivating joy? For me, I see joy as a kind of resistance, right? Um, Mariam Kaba says that hope is a discipline. And how do you respond to this, of seeing hope as something that you, you discipline yourself into? I think being here for me is a sense of that hope. Um, in the sense that, you know, to be a, one, a, young, a young woman working in this space that is traditionally a space that is very institutional, very state controlled, and I, and, I, and I mean like museums, yeah? We know, for example, in Kenya, you have NMK, which is the National Museums of Kenya, that is a custodian of the country's heritage. So very actively, this is not a space that we are encouraged to be in. So we have to, I think for me, I have to recognize that this is not a space that I'm welcome, exactly. But what it does is when I see people who identify with my struggle and my frustrations and my gaps think, okay, I can do this also, that for me is where the joy comes from. So for example, I think a couple of months ago, someone shared uh, on Twitter a copy of their grandfather's passbook, the Kipande, full details, everything. And I thought for someone to reach back into their own personal archives, take something that means so much to them, and share it with the world because of what they've seen. I think for me, a lot of joy comes from that, but it, it is very exhausting. And I think the fact that um, we are volunteers makes it more exhausting uh, because we're all doing this in our spare time with very little funds and very little resources to support this work. But again, going back to the question of, I mean, taking occasional brain conversations. Another thing that perhaps I should mention about the work that we're doing is that there are two things that we don't ignore. And the first one is emotion. I don't believe that this work should be devoid of emotion, that I should come to it and separate myself. I bring my whole self. You know, if I'm, if I'm doing an interview, if I'm visiting a site, it's me, it's Chao who has lived all these years, who is there. Whether she's crying, whether she's happy, I'm there with my emotions. And the second one, but in reality, we've been doing this work for two years. You know, if this is a child who was in school, you know, this is, two years is a, is a short time in terms of knowledge. Uh, dissemination and production, but on the other hand, it is work that we're doing because 
there are systems that haven't done this, people who haven't done this work. And I think a lot of joy and, and hope in seeing this come to life in different spaces, whether it's in film, in architecture, in anything, you know, in, in looking at how this period of detention manifested in different things, in things like transport. So how are detainees, ask yourself, how are detainees being transported from Nyeri to Lodwa? They're not walking, there are no roads, you know. So you have flights, East African Airways, chartering detainee planes. You have trains, you know. Um, there's a train that the detainees had nicknamed Gary Awaya because the windows were sealed with barbed wire. And some of the detainees you know. built the roads that exactly. would take them to the and next And the airstrips and the right. airfields. So for example, the first airport. Everything. By Embakasi Airport, do you mean what we now know as Jomo Kenyatta International I Airport? So. I think it moved. It is, it is, yeah. is it the mm -hmm. same, exact same mm -hmm. location? Yeah, then it's that one. You see, it, it, it's in our transport systems, you know, our structures, our land, everything that, that um, we own. But I think the final thing that I would mention is subverting this, this idea that history is lost. As Africans, we often grow up with an evolution or a change, or it's something different. It's not lost, but it's something different. And when we speak to the question of where do we find this history, I think we have a lot outside archives, outside books, we have people. Um, a key part of MBC and what we'd like to do should we have funds is to have like a dedicated oral history page. For me, I think the intangible experience is perhaps even more crucial than the tangible one, <coughs> sorry and who was raised in one of the villages said, one time we were talking and she said, eh, no unajua ngwashe ilisaidia wakikuyu sana. So I asked her, what do you mean? She told me when you're in the village, um, when you'd go and uproot something, you had to plant something the same day. So uki, ukivuna unapanda. And for them, that was their way of making sure that there was you couldn't have enough food in a post village, in a concentrated village, but you should have food. And that's how they were surviving. Everyone knew that if you approve something, you have to plant something at the same time because that's what you're depending on, you know. So I think it's these stories that we need to see more of, we need to hear more, and we need to be very visible about. Right. Um, so we're going to open up for questions or comments or reflections. Please, please keep it brief so that we get out of here in good time. So, um, as you all know, Uber drivers hike their prices and refuse to take calls after a certain hour. So I really want us out of here um, in good time. Um, as we are thinking about our questions, um, I'd just like to re you to co-create with us. Um, this is a conversation that will be edited into a podcast. And if you have a story that you'd like to share, a reflection that you would like to share with us, um, you can go in there and record something. Um, send it to the number that will be on your screen. Um, it's, it's going to show on your screen just now. And we'll put them together as part of, you know, intros and things in the podcast, right? Experience for all of us, right? Second announcement is for those of us who joined us when we already began, there'll be a second chance to look at the installation once this conversation is done. Um, we're going to do it in a socially distanced way. So we'll be taking five people at a time. Um, so please follow Baraza staff, that's Lisa, that's Cynthia, they're going to be showing you the way to the installation and you'll be able to exit using our other door. Sawa sawa. All right, um, Maurice, you can maybe take a round of questions or comments or reflections which really have to be brief. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for sharing what you shared. Um, my my question is rotated around two comments I had. One in TED Talk, a lady said, the colonialists came and then they were like, so they discovered something. So do you think my ancestors and grandfathers didn't know that it exists? Then the second was, I d we took a hike and um, in Mount Kenya and then there is this m lake called Lake Elsa or something. And the guy who was guiding us was like, I'm so bitter, said, like us, we've already, gone through our system, advantages and disadvantages of colonialism. How is it that we can change the textbooks to, for history for the next generation, such that the curriculum is changed to the history that we want and not what was approved as textbooks by the colonialists? Uh, hello, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I just wanted to find out, even as we continue to, to revisit these really painful memories, 
Of course, we live in a really globalized time. How do we go forward knowing what we know and still be able to coexist with British people or Caucasians? What's, what's that balance? Um, I have a question because I have quite a similar practice. I, I work with the Colonial Film Archives. How do you mitigate the impact on the audiences? You and Christine talked about uh, developing a practice towards joy. And I'm interested in at, at what point or in what ways are we able to mitigate recirculating this relatively traumatizing material with um, care, like a practice of care towards our audiences? Okay. <laughs> um, I think just to speak to the point, it uh, becomes intolerable once the possibility of removing it crosses your mind. Like you'll never go back to, to being okay once you know you can change something. So I think in terms of names and place names, it's not so much, I think now a question of if but when. Um, and looking at, so for, if you look at NBC, NBC is a very, it's a, it's a, it's a contradiction. Because when you have the term museum, you expect building, you expect objects. But what we are doing is saying we have no objects, we have no physical, but I know we have platforms to share and to collect, to collect data and to collate and to curate. And these platforms are reaching more people than the same textbooks that we, we were using. So I think it's about you know, being, being, working within the digital space and seeing the impact that it has on reaching audiences is about having purposeful campaigns or, or things that are geared towards this. So for example, one of the things I've always thought about is that can we crowdsource place names? So what was Mount Kenya called by the M, by the Kikuyu, by the Maasai? Of course it had different names, you know, different this nature of things that are sort of like set in stone by using the systems that are available to us. I think that has always been the belief that I hold strong. Whether it, it's possible, I don't know, but I think the fact that we're here based on work that we've been doing online shows that it is possible, yeah. Just to speak to, sorry, to speak to the question about care, um, one of the things that we make sure to do in this event, number one is to provide an opportunity for reflection and talk back. Like I said, the voice notes, that's what they're part, it's like part of decompressing, and also the space at the back, like a physical space where you can actually remove yourself from this situation, and then come back when you're ready, I think is important. Um, but I would say this about um, a lot of this work happens with the second generation or the third generation that removed from mm -hmm. this trauma. Because the generation that went through it a lot of times is, it's just too painful and just too raw. It's just last year that my grandmother told me that she actually dug one of those trenches around their village. Like, she, she went and showed me where it was, and I could see that, I mean, she's almost 80 now, but she was completely broken, even just think, you know, trying to talk about it, right? Um, and this has happened in a lot of, in very many struggles, right? That, for example, the Holocaust generation went through it, mm -hmm. but the people who, in Germany, for example, who made sure that Germans are taught about it in school, that memorials are erected, that people don't forget, that the narratives are not revisionist, were the people who are the children of Holocaust survivors or maybe even the grandchildren, right? So we have a job to do that. It's not enough for us to say that, oh well, I don't know what that is or we didn't go through that, but history has shown us that the people who actually, who actually carry you know, the torch and do the work of like keeping these memories not just alive but also accurate, truthful, honest to history and with care are usually the second, the descendants of the people who mm -hmm. went through a traumatic episode. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's completely true, Christine, because a lot of the oral history interviews that we do, you find that it's often the third generation, but also people, I, I think one, one gentleman I interviewed whose I think grandfather was in a camp, his father said that if I sat down with my father, no, the grandfather, would he have talked to me? He never spoke to his son about what he had gone through. So it does um, very well speak to 
within in practice that that is a very real reality. Yeah, very many things. <laughs> I think we there was a question I didn't yeah. answer, Sorry, um, and it was around how do we move forward knowing what we know. <sighs> Man, I think <laughs> when I look at um, MBC as a space, we are collective, yeah, and some of us are in the UK and some of us are in Kenya. But I think what united us was the fact that we understood very little. So I think when we look at MBC, we look at it as sort of this space where if you know, you know, but if you also don't know, you can come to this space. For us, it helps us move forward by using our resources, pulling our resources and our skills and our time into this work. I can only speak to, to that experience. Um, Another round? The mic is there. Maurice is there. Maurice, there's one here. Um, you talked about the use of mobile cinemas, which drawed me to the creation of Birth of a Nation in the United States and how that had really skewed the view of African Americans in the United States. And so I wonder today, there's that continued skewed idea and skewed perception largely based on media and even how we consume it. Where, for example, if you have a child going to the United States, you're most likely to tell them, don't go hang out with black people, not because black people are bad or anything, but because they're in gangs, they'll get you into drugs and so on and so forth. And yet there's another parallel on this side where you know Africans, well, they're not exactly that smart, so you know, ETC. So how can we, I think my question really is, how can we, these parallels continue through time? So how can we change that, as you said, knowing what we know, um, and being able to disseminate that through the diaspora and ourselves so that we can create like an understood history amongst each other, aware that this is a common shared pain, yeah. Um, I'd like to give a comment about yeah. um, about um, knowing what we know, how do we move forward? And just like most of you probably here, I did high school with the advantages and disadvantages of, col of colonialism. But then now after high school, you learn all this about col colonialism, about what they did to our people, what they did to our culture. And I think one of the things that I've tried to do is make sure, for example, my younger brothers, my father, my parents, like we talk about these things openly. We talk about why did we have to learn this in school and this is, and this is what actually happened. Was it a lie? So I think um, building conversations even with the people around you, like letting them know about these stories is how we'll build knowledge and how we'll help a generation. Maybe my younger brother will grow up knowing the truth and maybe it will make him a better person and the generation after that, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, just a thought about trauma and self-care. I think there's a big difference between someone trying to do that work on their own and doing it together and also doing it intergenerationally. So just you going out to see that with your grandmother or something like that. And I think more healing because it's not an individual journey. Hi, I'm Aoski Mani. So the thing that popped up for me the loudest is education and programming. So I feel like um, from the detention camps to our current school and everything, uh, we are more what to think as opposed to how to think. Okay. I think uh, to answer the question, how can we change these perspectives of us? And I think the key word for me is that they're of us, but they're not by us. And the fact that, you know, this film, this, you should see the posters that the British gov colonial government was releasing during the, I mean, they're horrific about the Mau Mau. But one thing I know is that um, these narratives or these perspectives do not center our experience. They don't center our humanity, they don't center our experience, they don't center our, our perspectives. And I think for me, to, in a way, trying to change that or subvert that is 
very deliberately speaking to my own experience. This is, I'm not trying to eat, deconstructing the why. You know, we're talking about the it's just this, it's justness. But everything has a why and a how, you know. So we can, we can talk about how much Kenyans don't know about their history, but why don't they know about their history? You know, the government has criminalized Mau Mau for 40 years. Mara, the archives are in London. Mara, the buildings have been destroyed. You know, like there's a why. And I think centering our experience and understanding that decon for us. Yeah. Um, the comment about being intentional to have these conversations, I think really speaks to that. That um, if you now know that when you hear a community being described as cannibals or eating their children, like now you know what to do with that. I mean, I've heard this about particular ethnic communities in Kenya. Wanakulanga watu wow. You know. <laughs> so, so now that you know that this is where these kind of stories come in, they have a very long colonial history of colonial powers um, dehumanizing Africans in that way, um, justifying colonial occupation as a way of enforcing human rights. Do you get it? They were here to save the children from being eaten. <laughs> you know, so it's a way of, of kind of justifying the colonial enterprise by telling some kind of horrible story about the people you're just about to mm -hmm. subdue and conquer, right? Um, I think the British or white, you know, like colonizers generally don't just exert naked power, which is why what we are doing today is so important, right? It's not just about the facts, but it's also about the stories. Like what stories are we, what stories do we have access to and which ones don't we have access to at all, right? What Chao is talking about witnessing or truth telling as a way of responding to what we know now, right? Um, maybe, a, maybe a last round because we are really right on time for us to do another round of installation walkthrough and then... The question is around the physical spaces. Like, I seriously cannot wrap my head around, like, there's a girl's high school <laughs> that used to be a detention camp. Like, I can't wrap my head around that. Like, what are we supposed to do with those spaces? Do we turn them all into museums or... And then, like, what has happened with the girls? They're not so bad. You know, that it's just okay. So what do we do with the physical space? What do we do with Nyayo House? You know, like, what are we supposed to do with the physical spaces where these kinds of traumas happen? Uh, good evening. Thank you for a very wonderful presentation. Um, I wanted to answer the, the young lady about what, how do you, how, when you know what you know, how do you move forward? Um, one of the things that I have done personally, um, when I went to school in the States, they asked me what my name was, and I gave them my English name. And they corrected me every time I told them the English name. They corrected me how to say it. So by the time I'd gone through a week of that, I thought, oh, now I'm going to tell them my own name. So I started telling them my home name, my, my Kikuyu name. And now they had to learn from me in those names is for control, to be able to control us, as it were. So I decided, okay, from now on, I'm using my African name, deal with it. And for me, that's how it, I work with that kind of thing. That's one of the things I do to, you know, to capture, you know, to live on. Yeah, and to have my own identity as a Kenyan. The last one. Um, mine is just um, thanks in the essence that it was on Sunday we were having this cultural conversation with a couple of friends and it was the first time for Chow to join us. So I'm there inviting Chow to this event, not, known, not knowing that she's behind it. And I'm so grateful to be here. <laughs> it's my little celebrity moment. <laughs> Yes, um, so personally, to me, this is just um, unlearning to learn. So everything in package from getting personal experiences and all this and being here. Thanks, Barazalab. Yeah. Yes, clubs, 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 clubs. Um, tell maybe the last. Yeah, I think uh, the question on the physical spaces. I think this should be a participatory thing. I think this, this is not a question, you know, a participatory conversation where people say it could be turned into this or it could be turned into that. I think 
I strongly believe that history is a process. Like we, in MVC, we always like, you history, I history, we all history. You know, it's active and we have a role to play in it and seeing ourselves as active participants in change making, in dissemination, in sharing is that resistance that we're talking about. So as with regards to the physical, you know, that's, that's beyond our control. I, I think that's more of like a governmental thing. But at the same time, what we want to do is map them. So in as much as you can see them there, those are not the exact locations. And by exact location, I'm talking about coordinates. Like that's just placed Lodwa. So if you go to Lodwa, where, where would you start? We would really like to map these sites, like the exact places like Hola, places like all this. I think in Manda, which is in Lamu, the camp is now a hotel. It's part of like one of these luxury hotels, you know. So we want to map them, identify where they are first before we can even begin to speak about how they will be memorialized. But I think identifying them, marking them, and making sure they're known that this was a site of detention has to be done. Chow, just to add to that, people are already doing something with the physical spaces, yeah. right? So for example, Nyayo House, I don't know if this still happens, but I remember growing up when we were in town, we would never walk next to Nyayo House. We would cross the street and walk on the other side. Right? When you were on Loiter Street, there was a sign with our bodies, right? Saying that we are not going to act like this is a normal place, right? There's something here to take note of. And I take note of it by just crossing the street, right? That there are people who would just do that. Um, because there were these stories of bodies falling out of this building. You know, this is a dangerous place to be around. Even though they were not really talking about the torture at Nyayo House, right? Kenyans are already marking it somehow in their consciousness. You get what I'm saying? So I think sometimes we have, um, I think actively as people, we already do it. And it's important for us to be able to read that into mm -hmm. the way we conduct ourselves in physical locations mm -hmm. and to recognize that that matters, mm -hmm. right? The fact that people cross the street and would not walk next to your house, that matters. Mm -hmm. That was a form of taking note of what was happening mm -hmm. there and refusing to act like it was just any other building. And Does it? yeah, even to speak to memorialization to the people and how many of us didn't know there was a, there's like a monument, didn't know, yeah? So that monument was actually constructed after, it was part of the settlement case for the British government when they sued, when the Maumau won the case against the British government. The monument was part of that settlement case. But what's interesting about it is that when you just take this structure and you transplant it into a, a space, does it have meaning to the people? You know, if people don't know about it, if people don't use it, it's already been vandalized and, and such. So I think memorialization, as Christine is saying, is an active process internally as it is externally. Right, yeah. right. It is internal as much as it yeah. is external. Um, I think we have touched on everything that was raised. Um, Morris is going to take the floor in a minute, um, but this is just a very big thank you again to everyone who made time to be here. Number one, thank you for just coming, right? Um, this is COVID season, we are all in our houses. Um, it, it takes a lot of effort to respond to our WhatsApp text, let alone dress, get out of the house, come for an event, right? So thank you so much for that. Thank you for your time, your attention. Um, again, those phone booths are open for you. Um, just take note of who's inside, go in one at a time. Um, Maurice is going to direct us to view the installation for those of us who didn't get a chance. And even if you did, if you want to take a second look, now that we've had a conversation about it, maybe it will, you'll see it with some fresh eyes, please do go ahead and then exit through the door that uh, Lisa and Cynthia will show you. Final, yes, ciao, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to, to thank, um, MBC is a big, we're maybe a 20, 30 people team. So I'm not the only one who's working. I don't know if any MBC members are here, if you could just wave and just to acknowledge your presence and thank you. Um, I think um, it means a lot for us as a volunteer organization to have access to such a beautiful, but also central and accessible space. Uh, and the last thing I'll probably say is, um, if, we must, if we must sin, then let us sin quietly. And this is a quote by the Attorney General um, during the State of Emergency who, in describing the camps, describes them as disturbingly reminiscent of Nazi Germany. 
but then goes ahead to sanction these beatings and, and pass, you know, sanction them, whatever is happening in the camps. And he says, if we must sin, then we must sin quietly. And for me, I take that quote and I turn it upside down and I say, if we must talk about this sin, then let us do it as loudly as possible. Thank you very much. Claps, 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 claps. All right, um, that screen is going to stay up. The number is right there at the bottom. Um, so again, a 